Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, in the last lecture we looked at what is perception and we also looked at the classical approach to perception. In addition, we went ahead and saw the gestalt approach to perception, the organization principle of the gestalt and the law of plants and the limitations of the gestalt approach. Now, perception which is making meaning of visual stimuli is believed to be a two part process. In terms of the human brain, perception happens through something called a bottom up process. and something called a top down process. The bottom up process is a data driven process and it moves from top to bottom. So, if I consider a triangle representing how the process of perception really work moving from general to specific is basically what top down processes are. Most top down processes bank upon basic stimulus properties, add up these, these stimulus properties and come up with a meaningful percept, a meaningful interpretation. In contrast, the top down processes are generally motivation driven processes or theory driven processes. What it means is coming from specific to general. Most perception require the top down process and the bottom up process. And so, the next particular thing that we are going to understand in this lecture is the bottom up process and the top down process. Think what really happens when you see a tree like this. The process of perception of visualizing this tree of making meaning of this tree starts by the creation of a proximal stimulus from the distal stimulus by the eye. The lens of the eye projects this proximal stimulus which is the inverted image of the tree, the in inverted image of the lights falling from the tree onto the retina which then depending on the intensity and the type of illumination, the type of electrical current that is generated by the, pers the, the, the proximal stimulus sends this information onto the occipital lobe. The occipital lobe then integrates various kinds of information which is sent on by the retina. It is probably right time to introduce that the retina does not only passively transmits the intensity of light waves which are falling onto it, it transmits several other information about the distal stimulus onto the occipital lobe. For example, some information regarding the motion of objects, information regarding 
the contours which divide the background and the foreground and several other basic information in terms of the color, in terms of the texture are transmitted by the retina itself. These informations are then taken up by the occipital areas or the visual processing areas. Now, this process which starts with light falling onto the tree being reflected onto the lens and the retina and then the retina passing up specific bits of information onto the occipital lobe or the occipital visual processing areas is called the bottom up process. This percept which is formed, this interpretation which is formed from the primary inputs from the retina is then compared with pre stored notions or pre stored representations into the brain and then a meaningful interpretation, a meaningful idea is made about the particular object in the environment. In this case, the idea that this is the tree composed of two parts, the bottom up process will include those processes or those events in through which the green color, the brown color of the trunk, the green color of the leaf, the shape size of the tree, the texture of where the tree is standing, how far it is from some other object in, in the visual field. These kind of informations which lead us or the kind of structure of the leaf, the idea that it has a leaf and the idea that it is it has a certain length and it is green in color, the bark is <coughs> brown in color, it has roots, it has fruits, these kind of information which leads us to identify a particular visual stimulus as a tree is the, uh, the bottom up process. Whereas, taking all these information together, this percept together and comprising them to a prototype of a tree to the idea of a tree which is stored into the long term memory is the top down process. Basically, most perceptual processes or most perceptual events require the integration of both the top down and the bottom up process. So, let us start with understanding what are the bottom up processes in perception and looking at some of the bottom up processes in perception which are used for understanding the perceptual process. The, bot the term bottom up process or data driven process essentially means perceiver starts the per per person who is perceiving the brain which is perceiving the uh, image starts with bits and pieces of information of the object in the environment integrating them together to forming a percept. As I was explaining if you are looking at a tree the idea that green leaves are there, <coughs> brown trunk is there, fruits are there, flowers are there, it is of certain height, it is of certain texture all this information which is passed on from the retina onto the occipital visual processing area is what is the bottom up process. So, basically in this case in this particular image I have brought an image I have got an image which will explain to you or which will try and explain to you what is the how do we interpret the meaning of this particular image through bottom up and top down process. So, looking at this particular thing this particular image, what do you see? Most people think of this as a corridor of a cathedral, of a old building or of a European building or some kind of a corridor out there. The idea that this is a corridor can be generated by both the top down and the bottom up process. From for the bottom up process, what would happen is you would see into this picture and based on the kind of shading, based on the kind of light that is have that it is having, based on the kind of architecture that it has, the kind of curves that it has, the kind of uh, ar architecture, the kind of bricks that are making this, the diverging lines inside this, this image, the diverging lines which is inside there 
uh, all these information basic information the kind of steps that you see the kind of arches that you see these and and the lightings the pattern the shading the color all these integrate together to give you the idea that this is an hall and this process of using these information from the visual field to tell you that this is an hall is what is the bottom up process in contrast to it the top down process will look at this particular picture and compare it with something that you have seen before and will try to match up so if you have ever been into a hall like this before or if you have been to a cathedral before which has similar interpretations or which were similarly interpreted or which was seen similar to it or how close that image which is in your, in your mind that representation of a hall is, is, is in your mind how close that fits to this that gives rise to or that if, if you are using that to interpret that this is a corridor of a cathedral if you are using that particular image or if you are using that approach to, to make giving meaning to this image that is called the top down process. So, this picture through a bottom up process is basically coming up from facts like the depth, the figure, the ground and texture, semicircular arches, semicircular blocks, doors and so on and so forth. Now, how do we understand the bottom up process? A easier way to understand the bottom up process is that bottom up processes for most, most bottom up processes as you move along the chain as processes move along from lower dimension to the higher dimension there is no possibility of correction. So, in most bottom up processes as you move higher along the dimension as you move up higher along the processes there is chances of corrections are very low. Now, how do we visualize the bottom up process? Think of a class in which the person who is sitting on the last bench is given the task of writing a word any word he wishes and then the next person to him writes adds up another word our job here is to interpret or basically make a story of what students write onto it and so the person next to the person who wrote the word first writes another word and this way this keeps on going you will soon see that the person at the front of the class has not much option. What he has to do is he has to look at whatever has been written before and based on that make an interpretation. Bottom processes are like that basic stimuli or first processes in or the first uh, inputs are taken in and from there higher inputs are made or higher configurations are made, but it is not possible to go back to the basic inputs from which higher inputs are made. So, that is how we visualize the bottom up process. Also most bottom up process are automatic in nature as they do not require some kind of uh, control by the mind, they do not require some kind of cognitive control. So, they are very automatic process as you see something the brain interprets the uh, retina of the eye uh, basically uh, breaks the information which is coming into its similar parts into its shading color and so on and so forth interprets this takes in this and sends it to the occipital visual area for processing. Also these are very reflexive processes bottom up processes are generally a reflexive process. Now, there are three or four bottom up processes that we will discuss in this particular lecture. The first is called the template matching process. It is a very simple process and what it says there are pre configured template into the brain and what really the bottom up process really does is it takes in information from the visual world integrates them together and compares them across this template with this template and when a match is recognized an interpretation a correct interpretation is done when a match is not there <coughs> another template is looked to a match is made and so on and so forth. Now, think of templates as stencils. These stencils in general use most stencils are used to make figures or to make uh, words or, or, or to make events which are re, uh, equivalent to the stencil. 
in template ma matching model or, or according to a template uh, matching model a reverse of what the stencil does happen. So, we have a fixed stencil into the brain, a fixed idea into the brain and whatever the eye or whatever the visual system is, in, is sending whatever information it is sending into the brain, it is taken in and compared to preconceived stencils out there. As the information matches a stencil, it is recognized a percept is formed and it is recognized as, as it is and this is called pattern recognition. But <coughs> if a match is not found, a next stencil looked into and so a large number of comparison has to be done. Also think of template matching or understanding template matching in terms of checks. Now, all of you would have seen what a check looks like. So, most checks have a certain area where person can write his name and amounts and then he has a signature area and then below you see certain numbers. What is the use of these numbers? These numbers are generally used by check sorting machines these check sorting machines which are installed in different banks and what these banks actually do is that based on various numbers and letters it then forwards the check to a particular branch. It is a very simple interpretation of what the template matching model does. So, bank sorters or bank check sorters are equivalent to a template matching scheme in which se several templates are there with the bank sorting machine and what this machine does based on which numbers and letters you have on the check, it will pass your check along to a particular bank. It is a very comprehensive model and the main proposal of this model are there are prefix templates into the brain and incoming information from the eye is uh, made into a percept and a template or uh, it is matched to preconceived templates into, uh, into uh, the brain and if there is a match an interpretation is eminent, if it is not a second template is looked about and so on and so forth. Now, there are several <coughs> obvious limitations of the template matching model. One of the first template matching model limitation is the requirement of a huge number of templates. Now, by its the design itself the template matching model requires that we have to have a huge number of templates into the brain. Now, since the brain capacity the idea that the brain has a fixed capacity and it cannot have a large number of templates. So, this model lacks a particular feature lacks a particular uh, gain over other models. Also when a new template or when a new image or new object comes into perception in the perceptual field, how does the template mat matching model account for that? Think of it this in, in, in this way. The phone industry started with button phones and then came in the first resistive touch screens and the capacity touch screens. Now, no matter we move from the button phones to the resistive touch screen or the capacity touch screen phones, people did not have any difficulty at all. The bar candy phone with the buttons had a particular mental template, this is what it is supposed to do. But then when people migrated to capacity touch screen or touch screen phones, they did not have too much difficulty into identifying touch screen phones or the functions of the touch screen phone, which means that the template of the button phone got transferred or somehow accommodated the new template of the capacitive phone or it extended itself to the capacitive phone. Now, how does that happen? That is not that is not uh, explained by the template matching model. So, it does not say that if a new model comes in or if a new form of uh, or, or <coughs> object comes in which is a little bit different from the template, how do you account for that? Also another interesting thing or limitation of the template mat matching model is handwritings. Now, a lot of people recognize a lot of symbols as meaning the same thing. So, how does the template matching model actually account for that? On your left on the slide you see a text written and so this text has been very nicely written in, in all capitals and it is very easy to read and most people are able to read it. On the left you see a very bad handwriting, tell me this is it difficult to read the text on your right? It is not most images or most letters are preferably out there and it makes meaning to you. 
A template matching model says that fixed templates are available to the brain. So, if A is written in this way, any deviation of A into like this will not be matched and will be an outlier or will be not perceived by the brain. But as we can see handwritings, whereas as, as you see here, this day and this A here, this A here and this O here and this F here, they do not match to the general way of how F, A, E and C should be written. But still we are able to read this, which basically means that the existence of fixed templates is something which is uh, a far off cry, which is not true. And so, to basically fill in the gap which was made by the template matching model to counter the limitations of the template matching model as we saw in the study of cognition that several uh, methods are used for studying cognition because one method if one method has a limitation a second method goes ahead and plugs this limitation or basically proposes something which accounts for this limitation and so a better idea of how of uh, how cognitive uh, process really works or how mental elements are processed uh, that gives us a great idea. And so, to plug in to this limitations to account for these limitations or the template matching model a new ma uh, model which was called the feature analysis model was proposed. Now, what is the feature analysis model? Feature analysis model says that when a perception happens, when we perceive things from the visual environment, we look for units basic units which are called features. We look for features certain features onto a, a proximal stimulus which, which is coming which is being inputted through the retina onto the visual, visual processing area. So, then when looking for when looking at a stimuli looking at a complex environmental stimuli we generally do not perceive the stimuli at as a whole but we break the stimuli into its several part into its stimulus into its different features and we look at these features perceive these features integrate it back and that is how we go ahead and recognize uh, a particular uh, a particular object when i enter my classroom how do i make this idea or how do i perceive this classroom the idea of a classroom uh, or the perception of this is a classroom is made by several features of the classroom. For example, there is a door, there is a certain kind of edges and angles which suggest which is a door or uh, there is blackboards and certain uh, ideas about what features a blackboard should have, uh, what is the background, what is the foreground and that kind of a thing is there. So, when perceiving something or when looking at uh, in any environment finding out the basic features or breaking a hole or breaking a hole uh, in visual environment it is to into different features helps us in identifying an object much successfully and much faster than gobbling up or, or then interpreting the whole uh, ob object as, as a whole. There are several support which is out there for the feature analysis model. For example, the idea that while perceiving something, the first step in perception is identifying features starts by works on frogs, on retina of frogs. And so, what scientists, what researchers did was they, in, uh, was they implanted micro electrodes into the retina of these frogs. And they found out that these micro electrodes they responded according to how the retinal uh, cells responded and so they found out that there are certain specialized cells onto the retina which goes ahead and responds in certain ways in, in different ways. For example, two cells or two groups of retinal detectors have been found one is called the edge detector the other is called the bug detector. Now, the edge detector is that group of cells in the retina which become active or which fire more when a frog retina or a when a frog actually sees or forms a border between dark and light area. And this, this group of cells are called the edge detectors. So, <coughs> within the retina itself there are group of cells which actually respond to the visual environment to the input from the visual environment and separate them into its different features. And so, one of the features of any percept is the contours or the edges of where the figure in the background is uh, uh, banking up to what uh, 
what the gestalt is said the first step or the first process in any perception is figure background effect. And so, this particular experiment gave ideas that in the retina itself there are group of cells which actually uh, make you distinguish between the edges the light and dark uh, fine of edges. Similarly, retinal cells in frogs have also been known to identify movements. So, if there is a movement these retinal cells actually go ahead and respond more vibrantly more uh, actively than other cells and these are called the bug detectors. As you can see when, when we actually see this woman this picture of a woman here this is what the retinal image is. If you look into it this is how the retina responds to and this is uh, been captured from a human eye through micro electrodes and what, what you actually see is we do not see colors we just see this kind of an interpretation this kind of uh, uh, black and white contours in, into it. Similarly, bug detectors have been found. So, when you see somebody running the bug detector which is there in, in also in the human eye it responds something like this as you can see it, it actually goes ahead and responds in the, this way it is responding to the motion of this person whereas, in this case it is responding to the edge detectors are responding to the edges the differences between what the figure background would be or what, have what are the contours which basically makes this the, this woman there. So, this is basically the direct output from a edge detector and a bug detector into the human eye into the human eye and what this this really mean it means that at the level of the eye itself the features are separated out. Now, one of the basic idea or one of the basic support which was uh, which was provided to the feature analysis model was by uh, someone called Irving Bedeman. Look at the image that I am drawing. what does this image look like and so most of you <coughs> will be able to tell me it is some kind of a cart with wheels into it and and uh, so these are the wheels this is the body of the cart and this is a handle for pushing it and so on and so forth so basically this image that i have done is basically an inconclusive image it does not make any conclusion, <coughs> it does not fit into any template pre existing template, but even when this image makes no meaning most people or people like the viewers that I have are able to make at least some features uh, ex extract some features out of it. For example, this is a cart it has wheels. So, this is which basically means that it can move it has a handle which can make it move and then it has some kind of a nose I do not know why it is uh, that is the, the kind of thing. Basic support by Biderman was provided that even if an image an inconclusive image like this was presented to people people were able to identify this and pro this provides support to the fact that people respond to features and these features are what gives rise to uh, to interpretations to the bottom up process of how perception really takes place now if bitumen proposed the conceptualization of something called geons and what bitumen says that these geons are something called geometric ions. So, Biderman gives the idea or suggests the idea that unlike the ions in chemistry there are something called geometrical ions or some basic shapes which are available and according to Biderman there are 36 basic shapes which are available in, in the visual field and most perceptions that we have are actually interpretations of these 36 basic, basic shapes. So, that is what say uh, what is uh, Biderman says and he says that any kind of interpretation or any kind of change in perception can occur by changing the arrangement of these uh, geons. So, these are the uh, Biderman's geons if you look into it <coughs> this is the shape of a cube this is a wedge pyramid cylinder barrel expanded handle handle cylinder cone arch these are some some of uh, 
I am showing you some of it, but there are different geons uh, uh, available and what Biderman says is these are the basic geons, these are the primary geons which are requ uh, required geometric alliance which are required and if you uh, look into this most visual field or most interpretations, most perceptions that we have is actually a combination of these geons. And to say that these geons if you change a geon you can change the meaning of an object, what do I mean by that? Let us look at this. So, this is the rectangular geon, this is the semicircular geon. So, when I look into it right now the rectangular geon and the semicircular geon it looks like an cup, but as soon as I change the arrangement of these geons I put this here and then this cups now become a basket or a bag and this is what Biderman says. All I need to do is change this geon from here to here to move this position or arrangement of geon and then you start seeing these two things together and that is what Biderman says. So, as, as you interpret it is basically features that make you make a perception and bottom up processes generally use the feature analysis model for making any kind of interpretations. Now, Biderman's concept that these 36 geons are necessary for forming all basic shapes into the world. He analogs this into the idea or he contrasts this into an idea of uh, sound perception and he says that there are he compares his theory of 36 geons with the 44 basic phonemes which are available. So, as you would know that there are 46, 44 different phonemes and these phonemes the basic sound structure we will study phonemes into the in 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 uh, the chapter on uh, on on uh, sounds uh, on and uh, so there we'll we'll study what phoneme is and uh, but right now what the idea here is that this four, 44 basic sounds they combine together they uh, get together to give all the English sounds which are out there and so. Uh, uh, what what Biderman says is that this idea of uh, looking at these 44 phonemes and making all the sound is similar to his idea of having 36 geons making all the shapes which are out there. And he says that uh, the, if, if you interpret a phoneme differently, two phonemes uh, differently, a different sound would be uh, would be uh, produced. For example, the da and ta phoneme are most confused whereas, the da and sa phoneme are less confused and this is one of the uh, basic uh, one of the basic uh, tenets of the or support of of uh, this model of uh, feature analysis model of perception or top down processing. So, Biderman shows us or Biderman shows us this particular uh, this particular thing and he says that when when we see this particular image most of us are at least able to tell us that this looks like clock the reason why this looks like a wrist watch or a clock is because it has mechanical parts which tends to move has a strap and so on and so forth. Although we all know that this is not a watch and this is no, no idea of a watch. Now, support from uh, Elna Gibson's 1969 theory uh, of perception of perception of similar letters also support the idea of the feature analysis model. Now, what Elna Gibson found out, he found out that items or uh, words, letters or words which have similar shapes, which are similar features are confused more than words which have different shapes. And so, what Gibson said is that it is easy to confuse between visual inputs of G and C then to confuse between G and F. The reason being that G and C both have a circular geon which uh, which which is attached to uh, another uh, small geon which is there, but if we look into G and C the the circular geon is not there here we have a circular geon here we have some other kind of a geon and that is the reason how. Uh, uh, how these confusions occur. So, confusions occur because G and C small uh, they share the same features or uh, with each other. Another support for uh, this feature analysis model comes from uh, the work of Nicer, who says that in a visual search task. 
So, what NISA did was he gave a visual search task to his subjects and what was the visual search task? The visual search task was easy. He had letters like this. written and within these uh, letters of having a semicircle, he hid a letter uh, with straight angles. So, as you can see there are G C Q and something like this, where and on the other hand he had letters like like this. Now, when he showed these two displays to subjects, he found out that finding a z in this case was easy, whereas in this case was it was difficult. Why was that? Because in this case z was very distinct, z had features which are very distinct from all other letters in this percept, whereas in this case what really happens is that z shares some of the basic features with all other letters z a t a t k l and so it is very difficult for for somebody to uh, quickly identify uh, z into the, this, uh, this particular visual input. The reason being that features are important to perception. He says that uh, the more closely two items share a feature, the more difficult it will be for us to separate, but the more distinct features are the easier uh, it is for us to, to understand the uh, percept. And what this all combines to, uh, to, uh, to make interpretation is that features are important for uh, bottom up processing a major uh, major idea in bottom up processing is that features make up percept. Another interesting model or another interesting study that we look into in the feature analysis model is called the Selfridge pandemonium model. <coughs> what is the Selfridge pandemonium model is a very interesting model to look at. Selfridge pandemonium model we will again discuss it in uh, another chapter uh, another chapter uh, in another coming chapter in this course. Now, what Selfridge mod uh, model actually tells us how does perception of letters happen. For example, there is a letter A and there is a letter B and there is a letter R. How does the visual system perceive this? Now, prior to this I explained to you how the eye have specialized regions which can the retina has specialized regions which can process information regarding lines, angles, curve, edges and so on and so forth and this information <coughs> is passed along to uh, the brain, the visual processing areas of the brain which takes this information and creates the percept or creates the perception. Now, how are these letters perceived? Now, what pandemonium model of self it says is that the perception of these letters for example, A starts by there are several demons, he calls them demons and I call them sub processes which are involved in the perception of A. So, if I have to perceive the letter A, it starts at a very basic level. Now, since bottom up process starts at very basic level, so the first inputs that I get from the eye is that A, when, when an A is displayed in front of you, you have something like this or uh, arched line, you have another arched line and you have a line like this. Now, the basic demons actually read this kind of input and they forward this input into the letter demon which will then combine a, this into div different interpretations. For example, two arched line and a single line can mean three things in the English language. I can mean an A, I can mean a V, although the V will not have this between thing and I will have a H. Now, the thing is <coughs> whether this is A, V or H, the interpretation of that takes place through this kind of a bottom up process at the level at the first level I have the line and edge daemon which will then which will provide an input to the letter daemon. Now, the problem with self rich model is that the letter daemon cannot ask back or cannot call back the edge daemon for asking any questions. Also, these daemons, the letter daemon or the curve daemon or the, uh, the 
demons which interpret li lines and angles these demons keep on shouting. So, there will be several demons will be demon of a straight line we have a demon, demon of a uh, slightly curved line on this side uh, L line and so on and so forth. So, those demons which actually process this input when, when I show an A now the demon this demon is the one which is excited and so it will shout the most and all other demon will shout the least will not shout at all and so input from this is basically taken in and fed into a, a, a letter processor. Now, the letter processor will take the idea will get the idea that there are two lines one which is slanted to the left the other to the light and one a straight line in between that is what is that is what the information is coming from the eye. It will look into this combine this to basically produce three inputs three things can happen with these lines three different English language letters can happen either we have a A we have a V or we have an H and there is a sec an another demon the highest demon which is out there which will then look at compare this with pattern recognitions with patterns which have been stored into the brain previously and say that A is the only percept and F and H are not. Now, this kind of model selfish model is very close to the connectivist model which we saw uh, in the first classes or in the first lecture of this series where we'll, we looked at how this connectivist model really works. We will come back to the connectivist model a little later into the chapter of uh, language and into the chapter of memory. So, this is how uh, the model really works when a uh, image A is presented there is an image demon which will first start shouting because this is an image that is there and then from later on there will be a feature demon. The feature demon is there are two lines and those, these feature demons will start shouting. Then there are cognitive demons will, will interpret what this is all about. Then there are word demons and then there is a decision demon which is the highest demon which says that this is an A and not an R and so on and so forth. A uh, good example is to look at it this is the B image demon. If you look here that then, then these are several other demons which represents various lines which are there and so those lines those demons which represent the features of an B will shout the most and which do not represent features of B will not shout and then there are angle demons. So, we have the image demon <laughs> the angle demon think of the demon as a process of how the processing takes place. So, how does B processing takes place? First, we divide B into a line like this, into a line like this, into a line like this and a combination of this. So, that is what it is and this is how first the image demon excites, then the line demon excites, then the angle demon excites and then the pattern demons because B could also mean it is closer to R, it is also closer to B, it is also closer to P. So, these are uh, the pattern demons which are there where because these are all the possibilities with this, this and this into being and then there is a decision demon which then compares this, this, this and this and says that the image that I have, the input that I have is the closest match with B. So, this is how the selfish model really works. There are several demons and these demons are the inputs which you get from the retina. So, this kind of a model has been designed by Selfridge and it it's provides one of the greatest supports to the feature analysis model that when we perceive something it is the feature that is important. The feature analysis model suffers from some very basic shortcomings. One of the first thing is that there is no good definition of what a feature is and what is to be expected. So, the idea of what a feature should have, what is a feature should not have is not very explicit and so, once a definition of what a feature should and should not have is not is not out there, we do not know what a feature, what should be a feature and how these features are identified. Another problem is there are different sets of features for different objects and how does the perceiver know which ones to use to perceive an object. For example, uh, uh, for, uh, for different objects we have different different set of each uh, for a face we can look into the eye and define a face we can look at the nose and define a face we can look at other features of the face for example cut of the face and define a face so which are the ones which are the prominent and which are the one features which is the most for example some people define a face define a person based on his eyes and some people look at the cut of a face the kind of hair that somebody has and so all of them are features of the face so which is the one which is the most important is really difficult and so it's it's one of the base uh, limited of the feature analysis model. Another interesting model which adds up or which <coughs> has been discussed as a bottom up model is the prototype model. Now, the prototype model 
is very similar to the template model, but then it, it is an improvement of the template model. What does it do? The prototype model says that whenever an input is given to us, whenever an input is uh, given by the visual system to the visual processing system, this is compared to a stored representation of information uh, into the brain. And so, what template model loses on to the prototype model gains on to that. So, uh, so in instead of, so what the template model, what the prototype model says is that instead of comparing the total visual image which has been provided by the eye, instead of taking this and comparing it 100 percent with templates which have been stored in a brain, we do some kind of close proximity matching. What we do is how closely, what we try to find out is how closely this fits onto uh, a mental representation which is out there. So, we do not look for 100 percent matches, we look at how closely they fit. The more closely a particular image, a particular uh, visual scene comes to a stored representation, the more chances of it being categorized as uh, that particular uh, the representation. Now, the brain, basic feature of the brain, the basic uh, uh, desire of the brain is to categorize. The brain does not has a lot of free energy. So, what does the brain generally do is takes up any few stimulus which has been given to it, any kind of input which has been given to it and then categorizes the first thing that it does is categorizes makes meaning out of it. The quickly it can categorize something and makes meaning out of it, the lesser it uh, work it is required to do. So, that is what the uh, job of the brain is and one of the things that the prototype matching model does is eases the, uh, the function of the brain or eases the task of the brain by making uh, an assumption that the uh, input which is coming from the visual system is matched in, in, in terms of uh, in, in terms of probabilistic similarities rather than in terms of complete similarities. So, instead of being as a whole pattern that must be match how closely and that is a prototype. Now, what is a prototype? The idea is what, what a prototype is. Prototype is basically an abstraction which is generated from several instances of a, a event or an object. For example, for developing a prototype we need to understand that a prototype is developed from several interpretations or uh, several instances of, of, of a particular event. Let us take a look at this. All four of these images are actually cars, right. This is a car which is a highly developed car, this is a very basic car, a small car and so on and so forth, but all of them are car. Now, when I say car, what comes to your mind? The idea that what a car should have is the prototype, the idea of a prototype of a car. So, when I say a car, the basic features that a car should have is what is a prototype. And if I look at these four cars, what is the similarity that I find into it? Most cars, most cars tend to have four wheels. So, the first feature is four wheels, it should be driven by an engine and so these are all driven by an engine. And so, no matter how difficult or how new a car model like come up with my prototype of a car will actually uh, try to match it closely with it, tries to match the new model of a car which is out there which closely with it and the kind of similarity, the kind of closeness, the kind of close approximations, uh, uh, the close similarities that the new model has with my car will tell how close the new model of a car is to my prototype of a car. So, when making a prototype I look at all the similarities in all instances of this image and from there I create a prototype. For the example, in this case the prototype of a car, my prototype of a car or anybody's prototype of a car should be something a vehicle first of all. So, it should be able to transport you from place A to B, then it should also be able, uh, it should also have four wheels at least. So, it, most of them have four wheels, it should have a body where you should be able to sit and a cover of some <coughs> as you see most of these images have, have that thing that prototype. Now, in addition to a prototype is something called an exemplar and in uh, 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 extension of the prototype in an exemplar. Now, exemplar is basically the best prototype which is available. So, the doggiest dog which is available uh, is uh, most people believe that it is uh, the doggiest dog is uh, uh, the 
the common home dog which is called the Alsatian or uh, the uh, small dog which keeps in barking which most people tend to have that is the dog yes dog it should have a tail it should have a fur it should bark and that is what the idea is. And so, this is how the dogs are companion to. So, an Alsatian is the dog yes dog which is available and so that is an exemplar. When I think about a uh, exemplar an exemplar is the best example of a category of a prototype which is out there. And so, the most classic car for me would be uh, uh, the BMW because that car has all the features or in, in terms of the Indian standard uh, the most prototype car of uh, the prototype of a car would be a Maruti Alto uh, is the most prototype of a car because it has all the features of a car it gives you all the features although it may not have some of the highest versions, but it is that is the prototype of a car. So, generally prototypes are abstractions which are made or uh, these are mental representations which are made from several instances of a particular uh, of a particular category of a particular class of events. According to prototypical medical model uh, matching model when a sensory device registers a new stimulus the device compares it with pre previously stored uh, prototypes. An exact match is not required. So, as closely a match of what you are seeing is to the prototype the easily the more closely uh, the, vi the visual input matches to the prototype the more uh, easily it is understood or most easily it is identified as belonging to that particular class. Now, the question is where do these prototypes actually come from? Where do we develop this prototype? And an elegant answer to this comes from a work done by Postner and Kiel. What Postner and Kiel says that the development of a prototype they found out how does prototype uh, uh, how do people develop pro prototype and they found found out that prototype development is an automatic process and that is how prototype develops it is by mere exposure. So, what was the experiment in their experiment what they uh, what they did was initially they created a 9 dot pattern like this which they called up the which they called as the prototype. And then with that in the first version or in the first instance they created a 9 dot pattern. In the second instance they took this pattern and placed it in a grid with patterns which are similar to this, but distortions of this pattern. So, they gave this kind of input to subjects. So, first subjects were called in initially before the subjects were called in a uh, 9 dot pattern like this was created which was the prototype. Later on subjects were called in and they were shown uh, the uh, uh, various distortions of the prototype with uh, something which is closer to the prototype and they were asked to classify these distortions which were there. For example, this is as you can see it will form a triangle here it will form a triangle this is kind of a triangle I cannot draw it right here, but then this is how it should look like forms like this and so dot patterns are like this which closely resembles a triangle, but not a triangle. Later on so various arrangement distortions of this prototype was done. In a third phase of the study several other distortions of the 9 dot pattern was given to subjects which were new distortions and people were asked to classify or to basically group these new distortions. What really happened? People were able so within this third uh, exp within this third experiment we included the original prototype the distortions from the old distortions into it and some new distortions. What was found out that the chances of identifying the prototype which the subjects have not seen was 85 percent and the identifying of identifying of old arrangements distortions of the original prototype were almost 87 percent. Whereas, classifying or identifying these new distortions which were nowhere near the distortions of the this kind of 
new distortions which were there which were ne never close to these distortions uh, new older distortions which were there was only 65 percent. Now, what is of interest to us is this 85 percent. So, although subjects was not shown the prototype figure at all they were able to identify the prototype figure on their own. Now, how does this happen? This happens because subjects when classifying something they have create a mental representation, they create a mental uh, abstraction and these abstractions are used for classifying things or taking new things and classifying according to these representations which are this and this is how uh, things really work. So, this is how the prototypes really come from. So, in the next class then we go ahead we will we'll start discussing about uh, the top down process, this is the another process model. So, as we, in today's lecture we went ahead and saw what are the bottom up process model, those models which take in data and uh, this uh, uh, the, the which actually take in data and this uh, uh, data build up accumulate together to actually form the percept. In the next uh, like possible in the next lecture, we will uh, go ahead and discuss about the top down model, those models which are theory driven, which are motivation driven, which help us in perception. Thank you.